<laughs> uh, well, let's, uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, and we're going to read, breaking into the context here in verse 27. In verse 27, we see, There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a, man, or if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in, in gratitude for what lies ahead, Father, for the, for the resurrection, for the, the truth of the eternal life that we have available to us because of what Jesus has done for us, Father. We ask for your blessing upon our time together in worship, our time together in your scriptures, and we ask that you would please open our eyes to what you want us to see and to apply and to share, Father. And we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Recently, I was going through a study on 2 Timothy. And 2 Timothy, as we know, is probably the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. His final words. And I've practiced, I've practiced saying uh, what I want to say so that I don't choke up. <laughs> but I have a hard time. <laughs> uh, Henry Halley had a, had a great summary as he was writing about this letter, the, the, the second uh, epistle uh, to Timothy that the Apostle Paul wrote. And he wrote, No hint of doubt, but that the church, now apparently being defeated, the church facing some false teaching, facing persecution, it was a difficult time when Timothy was pastoring. But... Uh, though the church now apparently being defeated would eventually be triumphant, Halley wrote. And no hint of doubt, but that the moment his head was cut from his body, he would go straight to the arms of him whom he loved and served so devotedly. This letter is the exultant cry of a dying conqueror. That's how Halley gave us the introduction to that second epistle to Timothy. And that, it grips me to no end. And I think, about, uh, I think about everything that must have been going through Paul's mind. And he wants to convey what is so important to Timothy uh, as, as Timothy carries on the work, as he carries on as a pastor to the believers. And I, and I think about the confidence that the Apostle Paul had. And he had a confidence in the resurrection. He had a confidence in the resurrection. And that brings us to, to the passage we are looking at today from Luke chapter 20. And, and Jesus was unequivocal about the fact of the resurrection. You know... Uh, we sit around and we think about our mortality. Every, 
every, every day we probably have some kind of reflection on our mortality. When we stub our toe or our knee hurts or we get sick or whatever it is, we know our flesh is imperfect and we're not going to make it forever in these bodies. And on one hand, we're pretty thankful for that <laughs> because, you know, these bodies were great until we were, you know, in our early 20s, maybe, <laughs> and then we start going downhill, it seems. But, uh, but Jesus has got, a, has, has got a perfect knowledge of what is ahead, and he takes on his accusers. And what we, what we see here, as we look at this passage in Luke chapter 20, is that the resurrected life is much more than the Sadducees could have imagined. It is much more than the Sadducees could have imagined. And I, I thought about what, uh, what do I call this sermon today? And, uh, and I thought uh, when it comes to a title, I think simply the three words, so much more, sum it up for me. When I think about uh, what Jesus held out as hope as he corrected his critics, as he corrected his opponents, Jesus knew the greatness of what lies ahead uh, for you and for me, and that we have access to only because of him. So. As we, as we roll the, the clock back a little bit, look at uh, the context and the background of what's coming up here, uh, we remember from last week that, uh, that Jesus had passed through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And he had encountered Zacchaeus, and, and Zacchaeus had encountered, had, had encountered Jesus, and it was life-changing for Zacchaeus. Jesus had... Uh, Gone through the triumphal entry, he had wept over Jerusalem, knowing what lay ahead for Jerusalem. He had cleansed the temple. Remember, Jesus had no tolerance for the fact that you had people setting up shop, uh, bringing, in, bringing in filthy animals, and, uh, and, and making commerce in the area where people of other nations were supposed to have the privilege of gathering to worship. And Jesus had had his authority challenged by the chief priests, by the scribes, and by the elders. And his opponents, they challenged him intellectually, they challenged him politically, they challenged him doctrinally. They wanted to find some way to trip this guy up because Jesus stood in the way of their power. You know, they were supposed to be the people in charge. They're supposed to be the ones who have all the following. But Jesus had a following. And they did, not, they did not take to that very kindly. We don't know a whole lot about the Sadducees. Uh, uh, you, can, you can read people with varying levels of confidence in what they know about the Sadducees. Uh, but, uh, but what we do know about them is that uh, they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels. It was, it was interesting because they were strict on one hand. They were, they were very conservative on one hand in that they were, they were firm believers in, in the Pentateuch, in the, in the Torah. That's where they had their confidence. And uh, depending upon whom you read, uh, they, had, they had very little by comparison trust and confidence in the rest of the Old Testament scripture. Uh, some will say none. Uh, some will say, well, less, they, they had less confidence and placed less credence on the, uh, on the, on the writings, on the, pro on the prophets, on the other aspects of, uh, of the Old Testament. But we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did not believe in the resurrection. And some commentators will, will tell us that this is a common, common little trick, little uh, dilemma that they, would, that they would throw out when they were arguing their case about, uh, about the resurrection. And uh, they come up with this scenario where there are, 
where there are seven brothers, and one after another marries the woman and has no children. And that is, uh, it's something that we have a, have a difficult time really identifying with today, but it was so important uh, back, in, back in the day to have, to have your heirs, to have your name carried on to have somebody who, who gets your inheritance. So, so God provided for that in the, uh, in the law and provided for a responsibility to step in and marry the widow. Uh, and so that was, that was something that then the Sadducees thought, okay, if there really is a resurrection, it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. You know, we've got a situation here where, where you've got seven brothers. One after another marries her. If there's a resurrection, who on earth is going to be the husband to that woman? And so they thought they had Jesus. And they thought they could stump him. And they thought all the glory could be shining on them because they have stumped this great teacher. But it wasn't a sincere uh, inquiry, you know, it was just a dilemma that, uh, that again, they thought nobody's got an answer to. And uh, uh, how many of you have heard the old, the old uh, question, uh, the conundrum can, is, oh, God can do everything? Well, can he create a rock so heavy that he himself cannot lift it? And they think they've got you stumped as a believer. And you know the answer to that question? The answer to that question is, that's a stupid question. <laughs> because that's a, it, it's, it just is completely nonsensical. It makes no sense. And there is, uh, there, there's no rationalizing your way through a question that is, that is so, uh, uh, just so ridiculous. And that's really what's going on here with, uh, with the story that, uh, that the Sadducees brought up. Now, seven brothers... And one after another, they die in this, in this scenario. And I don't know about you, but if I'm brother four or five, I'm not eating her potato salad on the 4th of July. I don't know what it is, but she is bad news. <laughs> but, uh, but here we are in this scenario where there is one brother after another. And so... You know, if you, if you think about it, and you think about just from a, uh, I hate that phrase if you think about it, pardon me, um, but, but when we wrestle with what's going on here, probably two scenarios are most likely. If you think about who would be her husband, whose wife would she be in the resurrection, I think the two most probable would be the first one, the, the first husband, or the last husband would be probably the two most common uh, conclusions that we would reach from a human logical perspective. And uh, that reminds me of the, of the shipping and receiving and warehousing manager. Uh, I don't know if you've, if you've heard this story, but this fellow was in charge of, of the warehouse. He's in charge of shipping and receiving for his organization. And the boss comes down and he's kind of shaking his head. He doesn't seem to be completely satisfied with how things are going with the warehouse. And he says, uh, so, so tell me, what kind of a system do you use here? Do you use FIFO or do you use LIFO? And the manager looked at him and said, well, you know, I don't know. What, what do you mean FIFO and LIFO? And the boss said, well, FIFO is first in, first out. And LIFO is last in, first out. So which do you use? And the manager said, well, uh, I, I use fish. <laughs> and, and the boss said, well, well what's that? And he said, first in, still here. <laughs> <laughs> but 
when we think about this scenario of who would logically be the husband of the woman, we'd probably think it's going to be the, either the first, the original husband, or, or the last, or the latter. But uh, Jesus just does not allow himself to be trapped. He just doesn't allow himself to get, to get sucked into a ridiculous argument, to a ridiculous story. He is, he is so far beyond that. And these, these guys are just, uh, they're so pathetically ignorant about who they're up against and, uh, and, the, and the reality of the bigger picture and the reality of the resurrection. They just don't get it. And what they, what they seem to be thinking or what they seem to be implying is that the resurrection would have been like an extension of this life. Would have been like eh, maybe a little bit better than this life, but it's, it's like this life uh, was, was the, the, the scenario that they seemed to be portraying. And they didn't understand that it was day and night difference. They didn't believe in the resurrection at all. But, uh, but they thought that they had a way to stump anybody who believed in the resurrection. But Jesus, Jesus sets the record straight. He says, um, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, and see how he contrasts this age and that age. And he says, in this age, People marry, you know, they're given in marriage. That's something we do in this age. But he says, to, to those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, I, I grew up believing in God. I grew up even, even when I was really young, this passage bothered me. I thought, if I really love somebody and get married to somebody, in the resurrection, is that relationship not there? Is that relationship not special? Is that relationship not unique? And that, that bothered me when I, was, when I was young, when I was younger. I still pretend I'm young sometimes. But... Uh, but that bothered me. And, and then when I got married to one of the most wonderful people on the face of the earth that I can never express my gratitude enough for, for the wonderful wife that, uh, that I've been blessed with, that should bother me even more. <laughs> I wouldn't have that special relationship forever. But the thing is, that's when my thinking is small. That's when my thinking is small like the Sadducees. And I don't get the fact that there's no second best in the resurrection. The resurrected life is so much greater than you and I can imagine. So much greater than the Sadducees could have imagined. There's nothing second best in the resurrection. Nothing second best. You know, it was important to carry on the family name. It was important to have heirs, to, 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 to carry on with the inheritance of what God had blessed you with. It was important to be fruitful and multiply. But in the resurrection, the, need, the need's no longer there. The, the people are already here, and as Jesus pointed out, it cannot die. So it's a, it's a different situation altogether. The Sadducees were, uh, they were trying to play chess by the rules of checkers. They just were not thinking straight. They did not have a, an expanded enough mind to understand what the resurrection was all about. And that's where we are. And so Jesus says that... Uh, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. An interesting phrase, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age. And think about that. I, I, uh, I think about that phrase, uh, to be considered worthy. And, and how? How are we considered worthy? We're not considered worthy 
by our intellect. We're not considered worthy by our deeds. We're not considered worthy by, by our merit. We're not considered wor worthy by being a little bit better than the next guy. You know, that's not what makes us worthy. What makes us worthy is what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's his perfect sacrifice. It's his perfectly righteous life. That is what uh, allows us to be worthy if we place our faith and our trust in him. And we see here in verse 35, those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more. Can you imagine that? You know, we hang on. We hang on to this life, you know, with, with such tight fists. We hang on to this life and that we are grateful for this life. This life is a blessing. God has given us abundance in this life. But we grip to it tightly. We don't want to let this life go. We do not want to let this life slip away. But Jesus tells us that in the resurrection, it's not just that you won't die. It's that you cannot die. How powerful is that? How wonderful is that? To think that you cannot die in the resurrection. And he tells you why. He says they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels. Now, that's not talking about the rank or the level of responsibility. That's talking about the fact that the angels are immortal. But the angels live forever. And the angels, again, um, you've got a, I read one commentator said, you've got a fixed number of angels. They were all created at once, and that's how many there are. And that's how it's going to be for us in the resurrection. We don't need to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren anymore because we're not going anywhere once we've been resurrected. You know, we will have eternity with our Savior and with our Father. And, uh, and that is what we have to look forward to. And so, so it says they're, they're going to be equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Now, in a sense, we are sons and daughters of God right now, of course, but not in the, in the full ultimate way that we are going to be in the future. It's going to be far more glorious uh, as we know. So, so these, these reasons why the, uh, the brothers were supposed to uh, marry the woman, you know, one after another in the story that, uh, that the Sadducees brought up, the whole concept of, of procreation, of continuing the family name, of, of uh, leaving an inheritance, of perpetuating the human race, none of those things are going to be necessary in the resurrection when we cannot die. Now, another thing that Jesus does here is, is just fascinating. He, he takes the time to address them and he addresses them right where they are. So the Sadducees placed a high value on the Pentateuch. And so what does Jesus do? He doesn't go to some of the more obvious passages from the Old Testament about the resurrection, from Job or from Daniel. He goes right to where they live, right to what they consider the most authoritative. He goes, he goes right to the Pentateuch. And he says, um, he says here, um, okay, let me find it. I'm, I'm like, Rick, my notes got uh, out of whack. <laughs> uh, Uh, okay, here we are. So, uh, so he, he, says, um, he says, the dead are raised, he says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush. Isn't that interesting? So he takes them right back to where they live for authoritative scripture. And as we know, you didn't have uh, you know, book, chapter, and verse uh, ways to identify where you're going. So Jesus says, hey, the passage about the bush. And they, and they knew, you know, they all knew what he was talking about. He says, where he calls 
the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And watch this. He says, now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. That's how Jesus dealt with their doubt about the resurrection. He took them right to scripture and he took them right to the scripture they considered to be most authoritative. And he says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So what we see is that uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is not the God of the has-beens. God is not the God of people with no future. God is not the God of people who are not going to spend eternal life with him. Such a fascinating way that Jesus addresses this. He tells, he tells them that uh, in the resurrection, you're gonna be like, uh, we are going to be like the, like the angels. And he says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Such a, such a powerful point that he makes. Now, when we, when we look at how Jesus addresses these folks, I, you know, I come away wondering, obviously there's no question about the reality of the resurrection. That is something that we have complete assurance of and that we can be supremely confident in. But what else, can we, what else can we think about in terms of our everyday lives about how we live after reading, reading this, uh, this passage, this encounter that Jesus has with the, with the Sadducees? One of the things that strikes me is that, uh, is that I tend to be too simplistic in terms of how I want to react and respond to people when somebody gives me a question. I think if people give us a question, especially if it's a, somebody who's a skeptic or somebody who's an opponent, you know, Jesus had opponents like crazy going after him and, and people who challenged his authority, challenged his beliefs. And when somebody comes at us like that, what happens? I think we tend to feel a little defensive and we tend to feel like, ah, I better give you the right answer right away. You know, I need to jump on that. Jesus, in, in all these encounters that Jesus had, he, he addressed people so much differently than, <laughs> than we would tend to, I think. And in just, in just uh, the, the, the book of Luke alone, uh, just looking at some of the ways that, that Jesus would, would respond. If we go back to the... Uh, to the beginning of chapter 20, we see one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. Okay, well, pretty clear, pretty plain question. And Here's what Jesus said. Jesus answered them, I will also ask you a question. How brilliant is that? How brilliant is that? So often when we get a question thrown our way, we feel compelled to give the answer that either the person is looking for or the person is looking to criticize, but we feel compelled to give the answer. And Jesus Jesus said, well, I'll also ask you a question. What a brilliant response. What an engaging response. Uh, how, how many of you are familiar with Greg Kokel? Uh, he's uh, down the coast a ways. But uh, Greg Kokel is a, is a Christian apologist, and he has a, uh, has a book uh, entitled Tactics. And, and it's all about sharing your faith and how you, how you communicate with people. And, and Greg is not one of these guys who wants to get in these big uh, argumentative debates. His take is, let's engage. Let's engage with meaningful conversation and let's understand where each other uh, you know, is coming from. 
So, so uh, he has a, he has a, he calls it, I think he calls it the Columbo technique. So you, you guys have all probably seen Columbo uh, years ago, the detective who he's, he's, uh, he's heading out the door and he, and he ah, oh, you know, just one more thing. You know, he's got one more question. He's always got another question that he wants to get out and wants to ask and wants to ask where you're coming from. And that's, that's Greg's take. So if somebody will, will make a statement to him or ask a question or something like that that's maybe challenging his faith or challenging his perspective or putting forth a, a different take on faith or belief, Greg will ask, what do you mean by that? You know, it doesn't sound terribly profound, but it is so important in this world to ask, what do you mean by that? Uh, look at how language has changed, has been co-opted. Uh, people taking terms that clearly meant one thing, and then they migrate them into a different meaning altogether over time. So it can be really important to ask, what do you mean by that? Uh, just, look at, uh, just look at different religious beliefs and faiths that people have. When people talk about Jesus, they're talking about people, uh, uh, they're talking about uh, quite a wide spectrum of beliefs of who they think Jesus is. And so clarifying, a clarifying question is just so, so helpful. So that's, that's one thing Greg does in this, uh, uh, in the Columbo technique as he talks about it. He's, he says, you know, what do you mean by that? And then a second question he'll ask is, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Another really important and helpful clarifying question. How did you arrive at that conclusion? Because a lot of people have conclusions with no reasoning that ever led up to it. Or they have conclusions that they've arrived at and maybe there's a, maybe there's a flaw in how they have come to that conclusion. Or maybe as they work their way to that conclusion, you'll see something else that you have in common with that person that can build a bridge for, uh, for engaging and building relationship and going from there. So just a couple of clarifying questions can go a long, long way. And Jesus, in, uh, in the beginning of this chapter, he responded with a question. He said, uh, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Oh boy, <laughs> they thought they had him, didn't they? <laughs> they thought they had him. But then they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death for they're convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Isn't that incredible? I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> if somebody is addressing me, backing me in a corner, do I even realize this is an option to, to not tell them? You know, it is, it is genius. It is genius how Jesus responds. Another way he responds in, in, in addition to this way of asking a question and then turning it, another way he responded was by silence. If we, go, if we go ahead a little farther in Luke, we see when Pilate heard this, and this is Luke 23 in verse 4, when Pilate uh, said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man, but they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. And when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when, when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was glad, for he had desired to see him because he'd heard about him and was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him. Herod questioned Jesus at some length, but Jesus made no answer. He made no answer. That's an option too. That's an option too. He made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. 
So this is, this is yet uh, another response. Now, I'd like to read uh, something from uh, uh, Pritchard in, in this regard. He says, let us note for the record how eager Christ is to respond to anyone who calls out to him. He welcomes the prostitutes, the drunkards, the hated tax collectors, and the despised Samaritans. He gladly meets with a Pharisee who comes to him by night and even answers the lawyers who try to trip him up with clever questions. Whenever Christ finds a heart that is even slightly open, he responds with grace and truth. But Herod's heart had been closed ever since the death of John the Baptist. He never called out to Christ, and he never came to him with anything resembling an open heart. And that is why Jesus had nothing to say to him. So the wisdom, the wisdom of our Savior in knowing to whom I should respond and how I should respond, it's an amazing thing that, uh, that we, can, uh, we can study for a, for a lifetime. And then, uh, and then one other way that we see that we see him reacting, uh, we see uh, in uh, here in 19 through 26 in, in Luke 20, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay the hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly. Look at how they're, you know, buttering him up and pretending here. It's just, uh, it's just sickening. We know that you uh, speak and teach rightly and show no partiality but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Wow, they're going to have him here because either, either the Roman loyalists are going to agree with him or those who feel oppressed by the Romans are going to agree with him. We've got him for sure this time. We've got him for sure. But Jesus says, and, and I, love, I love the way it, it, it introduces his comment. In verse 23, it says, But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. <laughs> they became silent. He silenced them again. Uh, so this is, a, this is a really sophisticated response he has. It's far more sophisticated than a simple yes or no. He gives them an instruction and then he follows it with a question and then he gives them a profound conclusion. Just, just remarkable. So, as we, as we look at what, uh, what has happened in this situation where the Sadducees thought they could trip Jesus up, where they thought they could point out the concept of a resurrection is ridiculous because in the scenario that we gave you, there's no answer for who would be married to the woman. They thought they had him, but they grossly underestimated the glory of the resurrected life. The resurrected life is so much more than they or we could imagine. But why? Why were the Sadducees so mixed up? Why was it that they didn't believe in the resurrection? Why was it that they didn't believe in the angels? Why was it that they thought they could stump Jesus with their dilemma? An interesting thing is that Matthew and Mark tell us something that Luke does not when Luke tells us the story. And Matthew and Mark uh, sum it up with Jesus saying that you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And it, and it makes me stop and think of all the times 
that I make a mistake, of all the times that I'm at a loss for what to do or what to say, all of the times when I may stumble. Wow, those are a couple of commonalities there, right? You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. How many times do we, do we make decisions or do we have doubts or, or do we miss the boat because we don't fully comprehend the power of God? That's what's going on in, in the lives of the Sadducees. The greatness of the eternity that we have with our, with our great God and with our Savior in the resurrected life, they didn't get because they did not comprehend the power of our great God. What a, what a wonderful thing to, to reflect on. And when we think of, when we think of as, the, as the saying goes, who's in our corner? <laughs> who's in our corner? Who's in your corner? The most, powerful, the most powerful being you could ever potentially imagine. I'd like to read you something from, uh, <clears throat> from Daryl Bach. He wrote, regarding the resurrection, we do not just go to heaven when we are raised from the dead, we are transformed. And he quotes uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 58. He says, life after the resurrection takes place in a transformed community where sin no longer exists. We live in a world so full of sin, including our own, that it is hard to appreciate how wonderful such an existence will be. Yet God assures us that he will make us like himself. It's not just where we are going that makes the hope so great, but who we will be when we get there. Who we will be when we get there. Uh, one of my favorite scholars uh, of all time died a few days ago, uh, Gordon Fee. And uh, if, you, if you have never read the, uh, the book that Gordon Fee and, and uh, Doug Stewart wrote, uh, how, to, how to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is, it is such, such a helpful book. But uh, Fee died a few days ago, and... Uh, there's a, a, a pastor who was a student of his at, uh, at a couple of different uh, institutions, and, uh, and he commented uh, about a memory of his first day in a New Testament literature class with Gordon Fee. And Gordon Fee, you can find interviews of him online. He is so brilliant, but so humble and so, and so caring. Just, a, just an incredible, in, incredible man. But the first day of New Testament literature class, Gordon Fee, with all of his, uh, with all of his uh, refinement, he jumped up on the desk in the front of the classroom. And, he, and, and in front of the class, he, he announced loudly, this is not a class on New Testament. Well, wait a minute, that's what I signed up for, you know, New Testament literature. But he jumped up on the desk, he said, this is not a class on New Testament. He said, this is a class on immortality. <laughs> this is a class on immortality. And he said, someday you will hear, Fee is dead. Do not believe it. He is singing with his Lord and his King. That's the confidence that Gordon Fee had in eternity. That's the confidence that he had in his Savior to resurrect him and for him to spend a life of eternity with his Savior. So how confident are you in the resurrection? How confident are you in the resurrection? It is real. It's where we're going. It's what we have to look forward to. And by the grace of your Savior, that confidence that Gordon Fee had, it lies ahead for you too. The reality lies ahead for you of your time with your Savior 
for eternity. So praise his name and thank him for the resurrection that is surely to come.